Well, it's been more than a year now since the Ukraine war started. Uh, we've had probably somewhere between 125 and 175,000 Ukrainian deaths and another 150 to 300,000 injured probably somewhere around one third to one half of that number of the Russian side. And I've only made one video on this. I, uh, I tried to record one video a night during the video Libya war. Um, I've been reticent for whatever reason to do this on the Ukraine war. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking back on this war, if you assume that this is a mistake for Russia to intervene in Ukraine initially, that there must have been some diplomatic solution, although there are people advocating the Russian position, like uh, who will say there was no plan B, that they had tried everything, they had sent entreaties and proposals to the West. Uh, and then now, as we found out, the Minsk agreements were never meant to be honored by the West. These were agreements to help deal with the uh, Russian minority in the Ukraine, basically in the East, that broke away uh, after the uh, Victoria Newland uh, and uh, and uh, Biden certainly was in this group. Biden, Newland, Lincoln, Sullivan, the current players were in the group that, that conducted a coup to drive out a um, president who was trying to balance. European and Russian interests in Ukraine, Yanukovych, and bring in a regime that was focused on uh, being very pro-West uh, and uh, anti-Russian. And uh, part of that process was to bring into the government, into the police, into the uh, uh, internal security uh, group, uh, uh, the far right, uh, and in Ukraine, um, the 20th century nationalist movement which are basically uh, the, uh, I think it's called the uh, Organization of Ukrainian Nationalists, the OUN. Uh, and there were two groups, OUN, I think B, and the other group was uh, 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 essentially following a different leader, B being Bandera, Stefan Bandera. And... Um, uh, you know, my my father's a historian, and and he pushes back strongly that this uh, ancient or old uh, root Ukrainian nationalism um, condemns the Ukrainian state as an anti-Russian edifice post coup. Uh, to be tainted by Nazism. So Dad would argue against it, that. Uh, 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 so, you know, but it's there, however you want to evaluate it. You know, shortly after this war, and, and what the, the outbreak of the war, the Russians basically overran Ukrainian territory with the goal of bringing their forces right into Kiev enforcing a concession from Kiev that they wouldn't join NATO. And uh, and that seems to have been you know, the, the key issue. Uh, Putin called this a demilitarization, a denazification, and, um, and one other quality, demilitarization, denazification, and... Uh, Well, I, I got two of them. So, um, so in the initial outbreak of the war, you certainly could have blamed Russia, superficially speaking, for having chosen to break international law and enter Ukrainian territory. Although the Russians do have a legal argument. They are ready to go to court, claiming that this is essentially a defensive measure citing the fact that the Minsk agreements were deliberately violated, which were to resolve the uh, disputes between Ukraine and Russia in the uh, areas of Ukraine that were 
uh, had a high percentage of Russian speaking or ethnically Russian people, which is the Donbass and Crimea. But what is horrifying is shortly after this very low casualty, rapid uh, uh, pincer like movement to bring a lot of armed forces right up to the edge of Kiev and to basically put a dagger to the throat of the Kiev government and say, uh, we have certain demands that have not been met and uh, we're ready to take them to whatever level. Uh, let us resolve them now. And then uh, you sort of force a diplomatic solution using the ultimate means of persuasion. Um, <clears throat> and what's incredible to find out, this was at a, a, a time when casualties might have been 10 to 100 a day in that range. And now we're in casualties of 100 to 500 or even higher a day. Um, so um, this at this time, there was uh, this war was still in the below the top 100 bloodiest conflicts in the last 100 years. And now it's in the top 50, certainly, uh, maybe even in the top 20. Uh, you know, the Ukrainians have already lost more people than we lost in the Vietnam War. They've lost at least 150,000. We lost something like 58,000 in the Vietnam War. In March, uh, there was a, in late March of 2022, just weeks after the initial invasion, there was a Turkish peace plan. Uh, and there was also uh, effectively an Israeli uh, a peace plan, which was not Billy Bennett. Uh, and then, of course, the Turkish was the official Turkish government of Erdogan. And both of these uh, were rejected on the advice of the United States, uh, who told Ukraine they would support Ukraine, believing Ukraine could give Russia a real bloody no. So, you know, as of late March of 2022, the psychological uh, criminal blame for bloodshed, the question is, does it then shift from Russia to the U.S. for preferring violence to uh, these early solutions, which were to essentially promise that Ukraine would get out of NATO and stay out of NATO and remain a neutral country. And then, you know, here again, uh, recently with the Chinese peace proposal, a year later, hundreds of thousands dead later, uh, billions of dollars in damage uh, uh, incalculable damage to the heritage of the ecosystems of Ukraine. Um, so this Chinese proposal comes, and Admiral Kirby says that a ceasefire would lock in Russian gains. Uh, but what no one seems to have the wit to ask Admiral Kirby is, what if the Ukrainians do not obtain significant uh, uh, territorial gains, uh, then you're just going to feed them a new meat grinder that will ultimately lead to a ceasefire, but you need to see more people die first to figure out whether you can push them back when you know that it's 50-50. So why would you gamble with people's lives in this fashion? Why not accept the fact that it sucks that from the perspective of uh, Washington, Kiev, Warsaw, that Russia has some uh, troops in a small part of Kherson and Zaporozhye. Um, but these two states or oblasts, Don, uh, Don, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, in the far southeast of the Ukraine and Crimea itself, I would vote overwhelmingly to join Russia. Um, and uh, Anatole Levin has recommended that we allow them to have a plebiscite, let's say under UN uh, uh, supervision, 
And, and you know, this is our way out of this problem of peace uh, proposals and ceasefires is, yes, if Russia controls part of the Ukraine and there's a UN plebiscite, they will have a tendency to push people towards the conformity of obeying whatever law they are living under. So perhaps a few more people will vote for whoever is actually in control of the territory. But if you use a UN-sponsored uh, election, um, there's a risk that either Russia or Ukraine could lose in any of these plebiscites. But there are ways of instituting elections in these disputed areas that could be done just not at, only at the uh, sub-state level. In other words, Ukraine has about 20 or 30 provinces, uh, which we would call states in the United States, uh, which they call oblasts there. Uh, and um, so the areas that are in uh, occupied by Russia, uh, if they were submitted to plebiscites, if you did them at the district level, uh, there could be some winners and losers. Uh, Russia could lose some of these plebiscites. There could be rights of return. All of this could still be negotiated under a ceasefire. I mean, I can show you a map. And actually, is that good enough? No, it's not. Um, <laughs> the amount of territory when you um, take, put aside uh, Donetsk and Luhansk that Russia occupies of Ukraine uh, and put aside Donetsk, Luhansk, and Crimea, which are all very pro-Russian and Donetsk and Luhansk, the parts you could say that, that the Ukrainians control as representative part of Donetsk and Luhansk, about one-third of Donetsk. Uh, to represent the sort of uh, part of the population in this heavily ethnically uh, and linguistically Russian area um, that has been uh, the, the primary uh, military fighting Ukraine for the last eight or nine years is actually uh, the military of the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. So uh, we may never have accurate military statistics as long as this conflict is politicized, which is really interesting because even the Nazis in World War II, we can look back and we have pretty good figures on who died where. Uh, will this be the, a conflict where we will never have such figures or will they settle down and we get clarity as all these unfortunates um, get their gravestones and their um, death certificates. Uh, and we can find out historically just who perished in this conflict. Uh, so, you know, this fact that uh, Blinken and, uh, and this admiral um, both pushed back on the idea of the Chinese peace plan that would ratify Russian territorial advances uh, uh, is setting a, a marker. So how many more people have to die before, uh, and, and what territorial gains do you think you'll get? <clears throat> so in a nutshell, uh, we could have a ceasefire now, which would mean an end to the deaths until we go through some sort of uh, meeting process, or we could keep fighting. And uh, there's a chance that the Russians will get more territory. There's a chance the Ukrainians will get more territory. There's a chance that there will fundamentally be so little change of territory that the lives lost won't be worth it. So let's say the border fluctuates by a thousand square kilometers and 10,000 uh, Ukrainians and Russians die and 20,000 are injured. Is it really worth it to you know, have uh, um, 
several people killed and injured for every square kilometer of grassland that you collect. Uh, it does that at the end of the day, who cares, right? So, uh, in the sense that you don't, uh, you don't want to pay enormous amounts in lives for a border uh, in, a, in a given area. Of, I mean, I, I suppose ultra patriots could say, let's pay by the pound for every inch of our land. So actually, everybody has to make their own decision about that. But by our deciding that we do not want to sign off on an immediate ceasefire because of the current borders, this puts Kirby, Admiral Kirby, on notice that uh, whoever dies between when he made that uh, statement uh, and uh, when we uh, when we do ultimately come to some sort of negotiated settlement, um, and we're going to have to ask him, was this worth it? What territory did you um, obtain and how many people had to die for this territory? Thank you.